basic needs to sustain human life are clean air, fresh water, nourishing food, and adequate shelter. You can live for a long time without food and shelter, days without drinking water. But only minutes without air. What kind of air did you breathe today? Was it pure and fragrant as a country breeze? Or was it like this? The human body is a magnificent machine. With minimum care, it performs many functions. It's a chemical plant and thinking machine without equal. The nervous system with complex lines of communication outperforms the most modern telephone system. The mind of man has enabled him to overcome most deficiencies. It has created machines of great strength and capacity to work for him. And aircraft for fast transportation. For personal use and convenience, Man has created the automobile, man and his car. In comfort, he enjoys the pleasure and independence of personal transportation. But the creator of the automobile does not always protect himself from dirty air. He often takes better care of his car than of himself. Here, a demonstration is being given to show what air is and why it is vital to human life. It can be seen in this experiment that some component of the air is being consumed, for the colored water is taking its place. The candle flame flickers, then goes out. The component that was consumed was oxygen. Oxygen is constantly required for body metabolism, the complicated process by which the body burns fuel. The digestive system changes food into a form required by the metabolic process. Oxygen makes up approximately one-fifth of the Earth's atmosphere by volume. For all practical purposes, the remainder is nitrogen. While oxygen itself is not flammable, it does support combustion. Observe what happens when a burning match is lowered into a jar flushed with oxygen. When the burning match is lowered into a container flushed with nitrogen, the flame is extinguished because nitrogen is an inert gas that does not support combustion. Normal breathing extracts oxygen from the air and expels carbon dioxide. Oxygen-laden air enters through the mouth and nose and moves down the windpipe into the lungs. Blood in the lung tissues absorbs oxygen from air. The heart then pumps the blood through the arteries to provide oxygen to the cells. As the blood returns to the heart, it accumulates carbon dioxide a waste product of metabolism, and carries it back to the lungs where it is released into the exhaled air. The brain constantly needs oxygen. When deprived of oxygen for three or four minutes, brain damage may occur. Unconsciousness results, and after several minutes, the heart stops beating. Normal air contains a little more than 20% oxygen. Atmospheres containing less than 16% are hazardous. This is the minimum that will support normal combustion. The Bureau of Mines recommends that mine atmospheres should contain not less than 19.5% oxygen. Oxygen deficiency can become a hazard in some mines, Atmospheres and some poorly ventilated mines progressively lose oxygen and build up excessive quantities of carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and other contaminants. Go, 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 go. 
There are other areas where a potential danger of oxygen deficiency may exist. For example, abandoned mines, caves, or caverns are attractive hazards to people unaware of any danger. Annually, many persons lose their lives when exploring unventilated places. This giant cube represents normal atmosphere. It has a volume of one million cubic inches and measures 100 inches on each side. The top two layers of yellow cubes represent the volume of oxygen in normal atmosphere. The greenish-blue remainder is nitrogen and small amounts of other gases. Human lungs have a vital capacity of about 230 cubic inches. At rest, the lungs exchange 25 to 30 cubic inches of air with each breath. The American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists has adopted 5,000 parts per million, or 5 tenths percent of carbon dioxide as the threshold limit for a safe eight-hour exposure. Carbon monoxide is also a contaminant of the air we breathe. It is a silent killer, one that kills more people than any other contaminant gas. Dangerous concentrations of carbon monoxide occur whenever there is incomplete combustion of a carbon, such as coal, wood, gasoline, and other hydrocarbons. Carbon monoxide kills by replacing oxygen, which normally combines with the hemoglobin of the blood. The affinity of hemoglobin for carbon monoxide is about 300 times greater than it is for oxygen. A small amount of carbon monoxide resulting from breathing contaminated air will accumulate in the bloodstream progressively reducing its vital oxygen-carrying capability. In high concentrations of carbon monoxide, a person may collapse without having noticed any symptoms. Symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning are similar to those of oxygen deficiency. Tightness across the forehead, dilated eye pupils, throbbing temples, weariness, weakness of knees, vomiting, and collapse. Adequate ventilation can prevent the contamination of air in working areas. When a gas which is lighter than air is the contaminant, fresh air should be taken in near the floor and exhausted near the ceiling. Contaminants heavier than air will flow downward. Therefore, ventilation for these gases should have the fresh air intake at ceiling level and exhaust at floor level. Protection against gasoline vapors and petroleum gases depends on care in handling and adequate ventilation. Warning signs and fire extinguishers should be prominent in all hazardous areas as an added precaution. If a contaminated atmosphere must be entered, protection can be obtained by wearing an approved canister-type gas mask, provided the concentration of gas is low and the oxygen content is over 16%. In higher concentrations, an approved air-supplied mask or self-contained breathing apparatus should be used. Hydrogen sulfide is a contaminant gas and may occur in many places, such as in mines, in chemical and metallurgical plants, and in the petroleum industry. It is highly toxic, corrosive, and when combined with iron and exposed to air, sometimes fires spontaneously. It is colorless and tasteless. However, in a concentration of 1 to 100 parts per million, it has a characteristic odor of rotten eggs. 
Although many persons have been overcome by hydrogen sulfide because they could not smell the gas, the average person can detect from one to 100 parts per million. Above this concentration, the sense of smell is paralyzed. 50 parts per million can cause eye irritation. And 1,000 parts per million will cause death within a few minutes. Detectors for hydrogen sulfide are available and should be used when there is any possibility of encountering this highly toxic gas. Sulfur dioxide is another irritant gas. It is formed by burning sulfur or by heating sulfurous ores and compounds. It's approximately twice as heavy as air. Five to 20 parts per million causes irritation of the throat and eyes. 500 parts per million is intolerable. Authorities suggest a threshold limit value of only five parts per million. Many other contaminants are generated as the byproduct of normal industrial operations. Fumes, mists, and particulate matter result from vaporization of metals often associated with oxidation. The more common toxic fumes result from lead, zinc, and cadmium operations. Fume particles range in size from one one thousandth of a micron to one micron and are readily airborne. Most fumes are irritating and can cause illness. In fact, fumes from lead and zinc are highly poisonous and can cripple or cause death. The hazards of silica or sand inhalation by workers have been known for many years. Where exposures are recognized, control measures and protective devices are usually used. When silica particles are inhaled, they may reach the lungs where, if they are retained, the cumulative effect progressively reduces lung efficiency and ultimately incapacitates the individual. Dust inhalation can be serious. Pneumoconiosis is a general term covering diseases of the lungs caused by inhaling dust. Dust particles may be silica, sand, or mineral dusts. Pneumoconiosis also refers to coal dust accumulation in the lungs of coal miners. This disease is based upon the reduced lung efficiency of workers exposed to anthracite or bituminous coal dust. Iron ore workers are exposed to metallic dust, which can accumulate in the lungs. Siderosis is the term applied to lung impairment caused by this accumulation. The size of dust particles is important with regard to both hazards and retention in the lungs. They are measured in microns, which is a unit of length equal to one twenty-five thousandth of an inch. The most dangerous dusts are those below five microns in size. These minute particles can remain in suspension in the air for long periods of time. It is generally believed that particles larger than five microns are filtered out in the nose and throat before reaching the lungs. The dusts and gases we have mentioned are but a few of the many that may be encountered in our industrial complex. Protection against these contaminant gases and dusts can be accomplished through the use of protective equipment, good housekeeping, directed ventilation. Heavy gases should be exhausted from low areas, light gases from ceiling areas. Understanding the hazard and following all instructions and warning signs. The human body is the most remarkable machine on Earth. When taken care of, it will outlast most mechanical devices. However, we must all learn to protect ourselves and preserve the most precious gift of all.
our lives. This can be done only with the help of nature's bountiful gift, the air you breathe. Hello, welcome. Hey, I'm Skip Alzheimer. I um, just washed my hair. I didn't get a haircut. Oh, it does look like I did, didn't it? Um, thanks for tuning in for our AV Geeks lunch streaming show. Uh, and I should say right off the bat, thank you, Kevin and Rick, for buying me coffee. Um, for those of you who know me, uh, caffeine is my, my, my one drug, and uh, I use it liberally in the, during the day to wake me up. So thank you for keeping the neurons firing and the green matter uh, sparkling and sizzling. Um, so uh, in case you don't know, uh, we collect old 16 millimeter films, uh, things that they would show in school, on television, um, you know, wh wherever, military bases, uh, churches, and we have a collection of over 27,000. And we just got, I, I would say, another 30 recently um, from really amazing industrial stuff that we're scanning this week. And hopefully I will be able to show you by the end of the week. Um, anyways, we show them uh, across the country and in other countries a couple of times. Uh, usually we have a projector and we bring the film and we show it in a room. But um, times are a little bit different right now, so we're showing what we've already digitized and um, streaming it into your living room, basement, office, bathroom, bedroom, wherever. I don't care where it is, but um, yeah. So thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a film that I've been wanting to show, but it's silent, but you'll just bear with me on this. Um, I discovered this film on eBay and uh, then did research on the couple that did this. It's an, it's an experiment film. So it's basically showing this experiment that they did on their infant child and a chimpanzee infant to see if they could raise the chimp as a human, like how far would the chimp go on the, the uh, developmental scale that's for humans. And um, you'll want to Google this because this is outrageous. So anyways, um, we've got its comparative tests uh, between a baby and a chimp, and it's, it's uh, four parts. And then years later, I found the other parts, just coincidentally, it was really, uh, an amazing, you just put yourself out in the world and things like that happen. So this is the number four, um, which is the most popular one in the collection. Um, so this is, again, this is silent. So enjoy.
Oops. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> no soundtrack, which means um, I don't have a cue that I can go off of. Um, and yeah, so Oops. that's. Whoop, wait. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, that film is, is fascinating. Uh, and the story about it is, is somewhat tragic because, uh, the chimp, this female chimp, uh, Gua, um, Gua or Goa, I'm not sure how you pronounce her name, but essentially, um, she, they kind of sent her off and then she died from pneumonia because the, the boy, infant, started mimicking the um hold on a second i'm sorry one second i have a laptop making dvds over in the corner and it's it's loud i'll turn it off uh anyways so yeah so the chimp didn't fare so well uh and donald uh was making chimp sounds at some point um and gua a goa uh wasn't forming language like they thought. Um, so not great. Uh, this next film is a science film, more adventures in science. Uh, this one's about the size of things and kind of teaching kids about the concepts of size. So enjoy. <laughs> If you've read the book Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift, you'll remember that Gulliver said he visited a land of giants. He said they were 12 times taller than he was, and therefore 12 times as strong. Let's see if we can find out if Gulliver was telling the truth. The science of physics and measurement can give us the answer. First, let's look at a boy. Suppose he's five feet tall and weighs 100 pounds. Now, if he were 10 feet tall and his proportions remained the same, he'd weigh 800 pounds. Why? Well, this cube will show us why. It's one inch long one inch wide and one inch high. To double its height and keep its proportions the same, we must double its length, its width, as well as its height. We've had to use eight cubes, as you can see. If our original cube weighs one ounce, then our big cube must weigh eight times as much or eight ounces. When the dimensions of any object, regardless of its shape, are doubled, it will weigh eight times as much. So if the boy were twice as tall and kept his same proportions, he'd be eight times as heavy. But he wouldn't be eight times as strong. Why? Well, his body is held up by a set of bones, a skeleton. The strength of a bone or a muscle depends upon the area of its cross-section. A cross-section of a bone is a slice through it. Because a cross-section is an area, it has only length and width. When the small cube doubled in size, three dimensions doubled. Length, width, and height. But its cross-sectional area, a slice through it, 
doubled in only two dimensions, length and width. Let's see what happens if the size of a large animal increases. If the height of this elephant doubles, and its length and its width also double, its weight, like the boy's, increases in three dimensions, or eight times. But the cross-sectional area of its bones and muscles, its strength, increases in only two dimensions, or four times. Thus, the weight of a double-sized elephant increases twice as much as its strength. That's why doubling the boy's height and keeping his same proportions makes him eight times as heavy, but only four times as strong. One half as strong proportionately as he was before. What if a mouse were as big as a boy? A large mouse on its hind legs may stand about six inches high. If the boy is five feet or 60 inches high, and the mouse is six inches high, then the boy is 10 times taller than the mouse. Now, if the mouse were the boy's size, its volume and weight would increase 10 times for the length, 10 times for the width, and 10 times for the height, or 1,000 times. But the cross-sectional area of its bones, and so its strength, would increase only 10 times 10, or 100 times. The bones of the mouse would have to support 10 times more weight than they did originally. Each time our oversized mouse took a step, its bones would snap like toothpicks. As you can see, Big mice have a very dim future. Here's another example. This beetle is very strong. It's able to pull a heavy toy wagon. Now, what if the beetle were as big as the boy? How strong would it be? The beetle is one inch in length. If it were five feet or 60 inches in length, its volume and weight would increase. 60 times for the length, 60 times for the width, 60 times for the height. A total of 60 times 60 times 60, or 216,000 times. But the strength of muscles like bones depends upon the area of their cross section. The beetle's strength would increase 60 times for each of only two dimensions, 60 times for the length, and 60 times for the width. A total of only 60 times 60, or 3,600 times. So a beetle as large as a boy would not have strength enough to lift a glass of milk. It couldn't even exist. Now, what happens when we decrease size? What if the boy were as small as the beetle? The boy's volume and weight 
would decrease 60 times for each of three dimensions. 60 times 60 times 60, or 216,000 times. But the cross-sectional area of his muscles would decrease 60 times in only two dimensions. Sixty times sixty, or three thousand six hundred times. Since the boy's weight decreased sixty times more than his strength, the boy becomes sixty times stronger in proportion to his size than he is now. If a body is made smaller in all proportions, its strength does not become smaller by the same amount. In fact, the smaller a body becomes, the greater its strength in relation to its weight. If a body is made larger in all proportions, however, the less its relative strength, because the relative weight it must carry is greater. Do you remember our question about Gulliver? He said the giants he visited were 12 times taller and 12 times stronger than he was. Was Gulliver telling the truth? Was Gulliver telling the truth? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I guess the answer is no. No, he wasn't. Um, that, uh, it's a fascinating film, and um, it kind of poo-poo's all the giant insect sci-fi movies uh, that came out in the 50s that were truly awesome. But, you know. Um, this next film is not about science. Um, somebody pointed out, it's like, wow, you've done three science films in a row. And so um, that was a complete coincidence, I think. Uh, maybe we're just not getting enough science in our diet. Um, maybe we need a little bit more. And, and not the science that they show on the Discovery Channel about, you know, Nazi science or, you know, all the, the stuff that's over the top science. I'm talking about basic fundamentals of science. <laughs> that's what I think we need to be talking about. Anyways, uh, here is uh, something that's also needed. It's a film about criticism and how to do effective criticism. So here, uh, this is Cornet. Enjoy. You know, it really made me feel good when Alice asked me, Well, Ted, what do you think of it? Will it do? You see, Alice is the editor of our school paper, so it's something to have her ask me for criticism. She wouldn't have a few months ago. What made the difference? Well, I think it all began when I first found out something about how to take criticism. I had written a story my first story for the paper. I thought it was good. I had asked my friend Woody to read it and tell me what he thought. Of course, I was sure he would like it. Well, Ted, it's a good idea to have a story about the hobby club. You like it, huh? But this doesn't seem quite right. The ideas are all mixed up. We begin one place, jump to another, and then back to the first again. I don't think you can outline it, Ted. It doesn't seem very well organized. It doesn't seem... Now look, Ted. You asked for my opinion. Thanks. You know, that's something you often do when you're criticized. You act as if you, as a person, have been criticized. 
when really it's only something that you have done that's been criticized. But it isn't easy to think of that at the time. I was mad. Now, I thought Woody was all wrong about my story. But the next day, I began to wonder when the editor of the paper said the same things, only uh, firmer. Not good enough, Ted. We need a story on the hobby club, but yours isn't clear. It isn't organized. It doesn't follow any outline that I can see. Well, I've got a class and a paper to get out. Thanks for submitting your story, but... Oh, good afternoon, Miss Anderson. Alex, well, the next issue seems to be shaping up fine. Hello, Ted. Well, I've got to run, Miss Anderson. Uh, just leave those things for me, will you please? Troubles, Ted? Well, I don't pretend to be a great writer. But how's a fellow to learn? Not good enough. Not good enough. What can I learn from that? Well, is that all Alice said? That's the main thing. Alice usually has constructive suggestions to make. Did you ask her for her comments? Sure I did. Did you want them? You know, people often ask for criticism and they don't really want it. What they really want is praise. And that doesn't help much. Unless it's deserved. Come here a minute, Ted. Look out there. You know Jack. He's one of the best tackles on our team, isn't he? Yes, but what... You remember last year when he first went out for practice? He would practice then every time he got a chance. But he wasn't much good until the coach began to help him, criticize. He called it coaching, but it's all the same. Jack really wanted the criticism. And he began to improve. Then the coach took snapshots of Jack and showed them to him. That way, Jack could really see himself, see his strong points and his weak points better than he ever could before. That's what good criticism does. It helps you see yourself and so improve. And good criticism is what Jack got. Look at him. He's still trying to do better. So I'd say Jack wants criticism. Well, I asked Woody for criticism, too. And all he and Alice said was not organized. Not organized. Well, have you tried to find out if their criticism is true? Have you tried to find ways of organizing your story better? But, Miss Anderson, it is organized. I see. Ted, let me tell you some simple rules that work for me. To take criticism well, first you must want it. And then you must understand and evaluate it. And finally, you must put the helpful parts to use. I'll see you later, Ted. Will you think about that? There it was, in a few words. To take criticism well, I had to want it. I could see that if I wanted to do anything really well, I should want criticism. But that wasn't all Miss Anderson had said. She also said I should understand and evaluate criticism. Just what did that mean? What did I have to understand? Both Woody and Alice had said my story wasn't organized. But I was sure they were wrong. I decided to outline my story. I'd show them how well organized it really was. And at first, the outline went easily. And then... No. I couldn't outline what I had written. So I decided to try it the other way around. I wrote a new outline for the story, an outline that was well organized. And when I had that, I began rewriting the story itself. It took quite a while. I found I was changing almost the whole story. It read a lot better to me, but I 
wasn't sure. I didn't want to submit it again to the paper. Not without criticism. Not without knowing what someone else thought. Uh-oh, excuse me. Genius at work. Hey, Woody, I'm not sore anymore. So you're not sore. Hey, look, I rewrote the story. It's very good. Hey, here, read it. Oh, no, not that again. Come on, I won't get mad. It's against my better judgment. Just remember, you're asking for it. And I really was asking for it. I wanted to know what Woody thought of the story. I wanted to know how I could make it still better. And as he read it, I thought over what Miss Anderson had told me about criticism, how to take it. Want it, really want it in order to do better. Understand and evaluate the criticisms. They won't do you any good unless you do. Be helped by the criticism and help yourself by criticizing too. I had a chance right then to try the rules out. Well, it's different. I guess it's all right. Doesn't seem much better organized, though. No. I thought it was better than before. Maybe, but then look. Up here you say one thing, then down here. No, I'd better not say anything. You'd just get mad again. Be seeing you. That wasn't much help. But I began to think, want criticism. Well, I did want to be helped by Woody's remarks. Understand and evaluate. Understand what? Understand Woody, for one thing. He was on guard. He expected me to get mad again. He didn't say much, but he did say, up here, you talk about one thing. Yes, there was something wrong there, something important. Now I was evaluating Woody's criticism, and I was being helped by it. I revised the story and left it for Alice. And then, thinking of Woody, I remembered the rules Miss Anderson gave me for how to take criticism. They really apply to how to give it as well. To criticize something someone else has done, you should want to help him through criticism. Understand what he is trying to do and evaluate how well he has done it. And be helpful. Be as specific and as constructive as possible. And help the person criticize his own work. But that wasn't the last story I did for the paper nor the last time I asked for criticism. I've done quite a few since I learned how to get the most out of criticisms. And I've been asked for criticism, too, more often than I used to, which may mean something. At any rate, I've used Miss Anderson's rules a lot. And now look what's happened. Well, Ted, what do you think of it? Will it do? I'm really asking for it this time. <laughs> uh, somebody noticed the uh, wonderful penmanship of the student students in general, actually. And supposedly that was something that um, David Smart, the, the man who founded Cornet Films and ran Cornet Films for quite a while, uh, actually wanted. He wanted to portray uh, polite, and um, good grammar and good diction and um, also good penmanship. Uh, he thought that that was important to portray those behaviors to model. Uh, and the only time that he, you know, you would vary from that is if the film was about that subject matter. So if somebody wasn't speaking clearly or was using a lot of slang, that would be the point of the film. Um, but yeah, so it was always trying to uh, aspire to this higher 
level of presenting kids. So that's why uh, cornet films are often considered super square and corny because the kids are not acting or talking like kids. Um, so uh, this next film is about dumps. We did a, a show to film, I'd say like a week, two weeks ago, called A Day at the Dump. This one is called 5,000 Dumps and actually features a dump that is near to where uh, I'm broadcasting from. It was uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina. And um, I am probably gonna show this, clips of this on um, a local uh, Facebook site that's dedicated to old Raleigh to see if we can figure out where it is because it's, it's clear and you can see the skyline. Um, but if any of you watching from Raleigh can say like, oh, I know where that dump is, uh, let me know. So here's 5,000 dumps. Find your way to the real America. Leave your big cities with their urban problems. Drive along the highways, then off of them into God's country, up into the rolling Appalachian Mountains to these highlands of West Virginia. And then find a surprise. The town dump. Burning one moment smoldering the next. A reminder that ugliness can be anywhere, everywhere people are. Or drive through North Carolina and watch as this city of 100,000 burns its waste. visit the redwood country of Northern California as a lady disposes of her garbage. state, an open dump. There are thousands of them in the United States. More of man's cast-offs clutter the western desert. Open dumping is a health hazard. The Environmental Protection Agency of the federal government has organized a campaign called Mission 5000. The purpose, to improve the quality of our environment by eliminating 5,000 of America's dumps in an effective two-year project soliciting the assistance and cooperation of thousands of local communities. A typical American dump is located near Glen Burnie, Maryland, just outside Baltimore in Anne Arundel County.
Until recently, the average American has accepted the cheapest and easiest means of disposal, usually simply a dump. Today, the mood has changed. The public demands a better environment. New systems must be devised to control the quantity and characteristics of wastes and provide efficient collection, creative recycling of materials which can be reused, and proper disposal of the residue. Established programs must change to provide these improvements. More discards arrive. But look, the dump has been converted into a sanitary landfill. Maryland recently passed a law requiring all counties to develop a comprehensive plan for solid waste management. Because of its previous poor performance, Anne Arundel County was the first to be cited. They chose to convert the dump into a properly operated landfill where refuse is compacted and covered continuously. The credit goes to the Maryland Legislature, the State Health Department, and officials of Anne Arundel County. Incidentally, if the county had failed to cooperate, the new state law contained a hard-nosed provision which would have permitted the state to do the job and bill the county. Most states do not effectively regulate open dumping or open burning of solid wastes. Here at a recent meeting of the Minnesota State Pollution Control Board at St. Paul, officials are implementing a new anti-burning law. This was D-Day, Dump Day, before the Pollution Control Board. After D-Day, communities could no longer burn refuse in the open. The discussion focused on what scores of counties and hundreds of towns and cities would do. The flow of solid wastes would continue. Each community would have to devise a plan and put it into effect. In many instances, hiring specialized personnel, buying land and equipment, and increasing taxes or establishing new special service charges for waste disposal. The board set procedures to be followed and sent them to all communities. Most states have not yet moved this far. Moultrie, Georgia is famous for its tobacco, cattle, hogs, poultry, cotton, peanuts, corn, pecans, watermelon, and dump. But Moultrie's dump is being eliminated. Two petitions from local residents caused the Georgia Department of Public Health to place the city under orders to cease and desist within 30 days. The city has known for several years that eventually it would have to develop a better system, but repeatedly failed to take action. The 30-day notice is finally forcing action, but also introducing complications because of the short time allowed. Moultrie decided that a sanitary landfill was the most practical and economical alternative available. After evaluating several possible sites, this 100-acre tract was chosen. It is quite close to the city and has no drainage problems. Moultrie's buying it, will install access roads, and will eventually move the city's shops and garage to this location to centralize public works operations. But the old dump is going to be difficult to close because it is infested with rats. If the daily supply of garbage were simply cut off, they would leave searching for food and might invade nearby homes. Therefore, the local health department will undertake a systematic rat poisoning project at the old dump before the new landfill is opened. Then the piles of refuse and ashes will be compacted and covered with earth. Meanwhile, the trash is getting higher and higher. Moultrie is under orders, orders that are difficult to obey quickly. As Mission 5000 encourages thousands of communities to eliminate their dumps, 
the communities may encounter a variety of problems. Let's consider a few typical ones. Here a small town is contracted with a local private operator to run its landfill. He has plenty of equipment and personnel, but the techniques are new to him, so he doesn't know exactly what he should be doing. He's careless in grading to handle runoff water and causes water pollution. He uses insufficient earth cover and litters the surrounding area. It takes a knowledgeable operator to run a good landfill. Meanwhile, a nearby community, which has been dumping and burning for years, has decided to clean up. It will start its new landfill on the same site as the dump. The city fathers naively believe that if you dump garbage in a hole and cover it, you have a sanitary landfill. So far, no detailed plan has been drafted, no equipment purchased, and the mayor is still quite vague about just how to do it. Raleigh, North Carolina, will never be called a Mission 5000 success story because this city of over 100,000 people has been operating a sanitary landfill for six years. Here, too, some practical problems. Dust and a sandy soil, which is not ideal for cover material. Raleigh's landfill is located close to the central city and adjacent to a new freeway. The fill will bring a low area up to grade with a highway and will be made into a park when completed. Now the case of a community that went only halfway. This city of 30,000 people obviously has an excellent sanitary landfill. Good equipment, skilled personnel, adequate cover material, and plenty of space. But only part of the city's solid wastes are being landfilled. The officials just can't bring themselves to bury the big stuff. Material that burns easily, tree limbs, leaves, and furniture, and big items such as refrigerators, are still being hauled to the old dump. So the city has all the expense of a sanitary landfill and most of the nuisances of a burning dump. It's a state of mind, a habit. The city hasn't yet accepted the concept that it needs a total disposal system. This old dump has been closed and covered. In attempting to establish a new facility, the community could have requested advice from the state solid waste officer or the regional representative of the Solid Waste Management Office of the Environmental Protection Agency. Instead, they did it on their own, opened a landfill, which is really little better than the old dump. Cover is applied only when somebody gets around to it. State or federal engineers would have made recommendations on equipment and procedures, perhaps arranging for operator training to get the project off to a good start. If Mission 5000 is going to be a success, 5,000 communities will have to get organized. Heflin, Alabama already has. This huge tract is the site of an old burning dump, now eliminated and covered. Today, Heflin and Cleburne County have undertaken an area-wide effort by starting a sanitary landfill. Jointly, they bought equipment. The county hired an operator who admitted he didn't know a landfill from a hole in the ground. But he quickly learned the basic tricks of the trade, a small landfill face, proper compaction of the waste, daily complete cover, no waste motion. The state solid waste officer calls him a jewel. Next, the county will start a container collection system, which promises to reduce roadside dumping and allow small rural dumps to be eliminated. Nearby, Troy, Alabama has closed its out-of-town dump and is filling this huge gully only four blocks from City Hall. It used to be called Buzzard's Roost and was 40 feet deep. The key personality here is a city councilman who is a civil engineer by profession. When Interstate 75 was built through Adel, Georgia, the contractors purchased rights to strip material from nearby property. As a result, this 20-acre gravel pit was left in the middle of an industrial park. Adel's investigation showed that the pit was a good landfill site, 
It took less than four months to put it into operation. Water pollution may result when drainage from open dumps reaches surface streams or groundwater supplies. Here a new landfill is being constructed in an area where geological studies indicated that surface water would leach through the buried refuse and carry pollutants into the groundwater. The solution is to install an adequate drainage system to bypass surface water safely. Solid waste landfilling is an engineering project requiring careful design. If you think that landfill techniques are restricted to the sunny south, think again. It is the accepted method in the colder sections of the country also. Solid wastes are collected in all weather and must be disposed of in the rain, snow, and even during periods when intense cold makes it uncomfortable for operators and freezes the surface of the ground. Mobile, Alabama once had one of the worst dumps in the country. Mobile now has a sanitary landfill which handles 400 tons a day. The cost is about a dollar a ton, including amortization of equipment. But a dollar a ton is infinitely greater than nothing per ton, and the city budget is feeling the pinch. Officials are reluctant to impose a special refuse disposal tax, even though this is standard practice elsewhere. They have increased charges to private operators who pay fees to use the site. Here a private operator is seeking approval to open his own landfill to serve his commercial customers. He has obtained land use rights and needs only official sanction to start operating. The result of this conference was that he can operate only if he lines the bottom of the pit with compacted clay to prevent pollutants from oozing through to the sand below. Public and private operations can be successfully coordinated. The choice of whether a community wants to do its own solid waste collection and disposal or contract it out is an economic and political question, not a technical one. Lawton, Oklahoma, one of the first Mission 5000 success stories. May there be thousands of them. Lawton last year. The people were starting to object. The Comanche County Sanitarian was critical. The Oklahoma Solid Waste Chief indicated that action was overdue. The Environmental Protection Agency regional representative in Dallas suggested corrective action. The pressure was beginning to build. But Lawton might have just drifted on for years if the Oklahoma legislature hadn't stepped in. It passed a law prohibiting open burning by cities of over 10,000 population by January 1st, 1971. Lawton was put on notice. Members of the city council started to look at other landfill operations, investigated possible sites, and authorized the city attorney to obtain land purchase options. Lawton today, dump closed. On January 19th, just 19 days late, burning finally ceased. They would have made the deadline except for a few problems which had to be solved systematically. The city council considered six landfill sites and held public hearings to select the best. Numerous nearby residents vigorously objected to having a dump near them. The sanitarian satisfied some of the objections by establishing landfill specifications and operating procedures, a fence and beautification. Finally, this site was selected. It is two miles south of the city limits and is centrally located in the county. Other problems? Equipment was not delivered on time. Good operators were hard to find. 
But today, the Lawton Sanitary Landfill, second in the state of Oklahoma, is operating well. The site is expected to last 12 to 14 years. After completion, it may be converted into an industrial or recreational park. Yes, Lawton did it. Made a quick switch from an obnoxious burning dump to a sound system of solid waste management. Thousands of communities throughout America have a comparable problem. With today's increased emphasis on the environment, each town, city, and county will have to face up to its true responsibility to be a good housekeeper. In just two years, Mission 5000 should eliminate most of America's open dumps. The ultimate goal of the Environmental Protection Agency is to provide all Americans with acceptable solid waste systems. It sounds easy, but actually it requires hard work and money. You pay for a clean environment with your energy and your dollars. But the question is, can we really close those dumps? It depends on local leadership, not just officials, but the citizens themselves. Mission 5000 is a now thing. Look around at your environment. It's later than you think. It's later than you think, and by that I mean it's 2.08 where I am. Um, yeah, so it's interesting. It, there's this part of a series by uh, Stuart Finley. So they did um, this, they did A Day at the Dump, and then there's another film, which is, uh, I think it's People Who Recycle, which I also believe is made by them. And that one was made by, um, suddenly I can't remember his name. Um, Hold on, let me see if I can look it up real quick. Um, uh, hold on, looking it up, looking it up. Um, need a minute. No, it doesn't actually credit him. Um, less blank. Less blank. Uh, documentary filmmaker who uh, shot gap Tooth Women and um, also some music documentaries and um, Werner Herzog Eats His Shoe, which documents Werner Herzog eating his shoe after Errol Morris finally released his first documentary. Um, so I'll see if I can find that film and show it maybe later at some point. Thanks guys for tuning in. It's always great. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow, Tuesday, and we'll watch some more films. And they won't be about dumps or science. Well, there might be some science thrown in there. I don't know. Anyway, thanks again. If you like what you saw, please support us by clicking like on whatever thumbs up related icon or like related icon you can and subscribe because uh, somehow that translates into more people watching and getting the word out. Uh, also, you can buy us coffee. Coffee is a great way to reward us for our good behavior. Not buying us coffee, um, eventually we will run out and we'll, it'll be the slowest show ever. Um, also, you can go to avgeeks.com and watch other shows that we've done and other uh, films that we've uploaded, of which there are thousands and thousands and thousands. Thanks so much. It's great to hear your comments. It's great to see you guys again. And we will see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.